Hello everybody and welcome to this virtual press conference from the World Health Organization Regional Office for the Western Pacific. My name is Olivia Law Davies and I'll be moderating today. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Takeshi Kasai, WHO Regional Director for the Western Pacific, Dr. Abdi Mahamud, the COVID-19 Incident Manager for the Western Pacific Region, and Dr. Huang Tran, Director of the Division of Communicable Diseases and also the Acting Regional Emergency Director for the Western Pacific. So we received many questions already, but I just want to take this opportunity to remind you that it's possible to ask questions also during the press conference if you're connected using Zoom. Just type them into the chat function and we'll come to those when we get to the question and answer portion later on in the press conference. We're going to begin now with a short presentation on the current COVID-19 situation in the region. And for that, I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Tran. Thank you, Liv. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present to you an overview of the situation of COVID-19 and key activity has been undertaken by WHO Western Pacific Region to support countries in COVID-19 response. At global level, COVID-19 has spread throughout 212 countries with more than 2.3 million cases reported and almost 150,000 deaths worldwide. The pandemic is expanding and it does not show signs of slowing down in many parts of the world. The epicenter has shifted from China to Europe and North America and will likely shift to other regions. The case number and death in many countries, especially in European countries and United States of America, are alarming. Especially, nearly 50% of cases now occurring in Europe with more than 84,000 deaths so far. At the Western Pacific region, next slide please, as of today, there are 20 countries and areas out of 37 countries and areas that have reported cases with 130,000 confirmed cases and 5,600 5, deaths, representing 4.2% of fatality rate. It is important to remember that countries and areas in our region have a vastly diversified size and capacity. Next slide, please. This slide shows the number of reported cases per 100,000 per capita population. As you can see, Wuhan has reported fewer than 100 cases, but that represents the highest proportion of affected population. China, which has reported over 80,000 cases, have less than 6 per 100 person affected. The epidemiological data indicates that most countries and areas in our region are experiencing stage one of imported cases and stage two of localized transmission of the outbreak. Many countries have been able to flatten the curve after seeing a very sharp increase like China, Korea, while other countries have been keeping the lower level of spread of transmission like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laopedia, Brunei Darussalam. We are now also seeing increasing cases in several countries in our region, including Singapore, Japan, and the Philippines. Next slide, please. Taking an example of Singapore, it was uh, the, among the first countries affected by COVID-19 and was uh, very successful at reducing transmission of the virus early on. Now the country experienced the second wave which is uh, facing a last outbreak in the dormitories and represents 60% of the cases linked to this dormitory. As you can see, even if we are successful in early stage, we have to keep our surveillance, early detection, contact tracing, isolation, and other public health intervention to ensure we do not uh, see large-scale community transmission. And at the same time, we need to be well prepared for large-scale community transmission. Next slide, please. Over the past time, WHO Western Pacific Region and working closely with the country office and member state in the region to uh, respond to COVID-19. We have rolled out the regional action plan and also we develop, uh, support the country to develop the national action plan to be tailored with the country context. The areas of support include uh, science and research, communication, information management, 
partner coordination and resource mobilization, be punished, and supply and logistic support. Next slide, please. Up to now, the WHO Western Pacific region have delivered personal protective equipment for healthcare workers to 21 countries and uh, also delivered nearly 50,000 laboratory tests to 10 countries in the region. Next slide, please. In terms of partnership coordination, <coughs> up to now there are 80, uh, 70 operational partners involved in the response. 34 donors financially contributed to the response. 140 members of the Risk Communication and Community Engagement Asia-Pacific Group uh, participating in the response plan. Especially, coordination and collaboration in the region has been strengthened with the weekly regional director video conference with all member states, ministers, and international health regulation focal point has been conducted for, to provide updated information to, uh, to provide technical guidance and also sharing good practice and best uh, experience of member state in the region. So it is uh, my update on the situation and the key activity of WHO over the past year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Tran. It's now my pleasure to introduce Regional Director Dr. Kasai, who's gonna make some opening remarks before we begin the question and answer portion of the press conference. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much, Lee. When I briefed you uh, three weeks ago, I stressed that the pandemic is far from over in the Asia and the Pacific. This is going to be a long battle. The virus is now in 22 countries and areas in our region. Some have limited healthcare capacity, and others, such as Japan, are experiencing an increasing number of COVID-19 cases. This is not the time to relax. Instead, we need to ready ourselves for a new way of living for the foreseeable future. As Dr. Huang mentioned, over 5,600 people have lost their lives among more than 130,000 with confirmed COVID-19 infection in our region. I, was, I once worked in the ER, emergency room, and I know that these are more than just numbers. Countries others have lost their jobs and means of supporting themselves and their families. This has caused grief and hardship for millions. And I would like to express my heartfelt sympathy for all those who have lost loved ones and who are going through difficult times. I also wanted to take this opportunity to express our deep gratitude to those whose jobs are deemed essential and who are working around the clock to keep food available and maintain lifelines and health services. Thank you very much. Every week, we connect health leaders across the region in a teleconference. Last week, Minister of Health themselves came together to stand in solidarity to fight COVID-19. Ministers acknowledge that while we have countries at the different stage of the epidemic, as long as the new coronavirus is circulating, no country is safe from potentially overwhelming outbreaks. We are in this together and we can only get out of this together. And we particularly need to support countries that have limited capacity. Many countries have introduced periods of uh, lockdown and other measures. They have proven effective in slowing and reducing the transmission and easing the burden on overstretched health system. And today, we appear not to have widespread community transmission in our region, but they have also upended millions of people's lives and had a major economic impact. Now, the government in these regions are making extremely complex decisions about introducing or enhancing or easing or lifting lockdowns 
and physical distancing measures. As we move forward in this difficult time, our lives, our health system, and approach to stopping transmission must continue to adapt and evolve along with the epidemic, at least until a vaccine or very effective treatment is found. This process will need to become our new normal. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to doing this, but WHO strongly urges that decisions be guided by public health principles. The lifting of lockdowns and other measures needs to be done gradually. I'm sure nobody wants to see another spike in case by rushing the rift restrictions too soon. If restrictions are relaxed or lifted before strong systems are in place to identify, isolate and care for the sick, and trace and quarantine their contact, this will likely lead to a resurgence of diseases. Individual and society need to be ready for a new way of living that strikes that the right balance between the measures to keep the virus in check and enable vital parts of our economy and societies to function once more. For the citizens, that means accepting responsibility for protecting yourself, your family, your community by physically distancing in the community, frequently cleaning your hands, covering cough and sneeze, and staying at home and away from ourselves, others, when you feel sick. For the private sector, this means adapting new ways of working, such as establishing a staff to work from home where possible, and other measures to reduce the risk of infections in the workplace. The government, for the government, this means preparing for the worst, having system that work in every corner of the countries to detect and care for people in case of the large-scale community transmission. Another important job for the government under this new normal is to bring back and sustain regular health services. One example is immunization. Over the past three decades, vaccines have made the Western Pacific region healthier and safer from diseases like uh, polio, measles, rubella, and hepatitis B. But if vaccine rates go down, infectious diseases come back. In the past year, we've heard we had the case of polio in the Philippines, Malaysia, and China. And there were outbreaks of measles in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Samoa, and other parts of the Pacific Island countries. If we allow COVID-19 to disrupt immunization program, our region could face new crisis at the time when health systems are already strained. From this Friday, we'll mark World Immunization Week. On this occasion, WHO is calling on countries across Asia and the Pacific to continue immunization services during the COVID-19 pandemic where it's feasible and with appropriate infection control. Likewise, we're conscious that the health of millions of people in this region depends on continued access to care and treatment for tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, heart diseases, and many other acute and chronic conditions. We cannot let the COVID-19 response put their lives at risk by compromising these services. WHO is working day and night to support countries in the response and in this transition. We share information with the governments and their people, and we advise on how to find and isolate case, trace and quarantine their contacts so that the pandemic, so that the epidemic can be controlled and we can save as many, as many lives as possible. And we provide supplies and equipment. We know we are in this together for the long run, and we're committed to working with every country to find their new way of living that will protect 
people's health, economy, and societies. This is a region with a strong sense of community and strong culture of supporting the vulnerable. And this is the key to getting through this. We need everyone from the food sellers to teacher to prime minister to remain focused and engaged. That requires solidarity, unity, vigilance, and patience. It requires working together and supporting each other. We too would like to see, of course, difficult measures lifted as soon as it's safe to do so. We look forward to the day when we can once again hug our friends or go to birthday parties and enjoy community events. But for now, we appear to people in the Western Pacific to play their part in building a new way of life in which everybody contributes to contain and suppressing the virus and protecting the vulnerable and making life safe and livable as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasai. We've now come to the point in the press conference where we can begin Q&A. And we've actually received already quite a long list of questions. So I'd like to begin, please, with a question from the Pacific News Network. Uh, Ruchi Farrell asks, what are your scientists and data collection agencies telling you about the low number of confirmed cases in the small island states of the Pacific? I'm going to ask Dr. Kasai to respond to that one, please. So you're talking about the a, a small Pacific island countries? Correct, yes. OK. Um, thank you very much for these questions. Um, as of today, uh, six countries and areas in the Pacific is reporting uh, the number of cases. Guam, 133. French Polynesia, 55. New Caledonia, 18. Fiji, 17. Northern Mariana Islands, 14. Papua New Guinea, 7. It looks like a small, but when you look at the numbers of cases as a proportion of the uh, populations in the Pacific Island countries, these are not small. Pacific Island countries are our priorities because they have uh, challenges in their infrastructure, including, including the healthcare facilities, and they have uh, challenges related to geographical distancing. And we're having a regulatory conference with the Pacific Island countries to discuss how we can best respond to this uh, COVID-19 in the, such a difficult conditions. But I'm happy to report that those countries who is now reporting the case, they really conducted a very thorough contact tracing and uh, quarantining the people who potentially can further spread the diseases in their community. They're doing a, a right a response. And the country who has also not reporting, they're also constanting, constantly checking the number of cases and then uh, constantly checking a, the potential person who might be infected. Mm -hmm. And so far, they have reporting negative. So obviously, this is the region. They have some difficulties. But I also noted that they have a strength. One is like uh, they have a very strong community. And I understand that uh, many countries in the Pacific reach out to the community, engage them to be ready for this COVID-19. Other things I notice in the Pacific is that uh, there are unprecedented kind of partnership, partnership among the countries in the Pacific. But I also noted like uh, countries from Australia or New Zealand and other parts of the, the world is really trying to be together to support the Pacific Island countries. We need to continue to be vigilant, and we need to continue to work together so that we can really control this COVID-19 in the Pacific Island countries. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Another question from the Pacific Media Network, uh, this time about um, tourism. 
The Pacific, sorry, the, this pandemic exposes the global risk travellers have unknowingly contributed to the spread across the world. What is your advice to Pacific nations whose main source of income is tourism? I'm going to ask Dr. Kasai to answer that one again. It's not just uh, only the Pacific Island countries. Um, now, many countries are making a very difficult decisions. It's a dilemma. It's a very difficult decisions to balance the health and then its economy. On one hand, we wanted to really, really control these diseases and minimize the health impact. But on the other hand, how to make sure that economies will be sustained. The many leaders around the world is making decisions. Health is the a priorities. So it's not just only the Pacific Island countries, but uh, uh, it's a issue of entire world. But at the same time, I'm aware that the countries in the Pacific who relies on the uh, tourist as a source of their economy, it's very important. This is the a crisis, not just only responding to a public health, but it's also crisis of the economy. And I really wanted to plead the countries around the world to understand the situations on the Pacific and uh, support together also that part of the uh, crisis. I think we have to really work together to help the countries with the uh, limited capacities. Thank you, Dr. Kasai. Um, we have a question here that's come in from a few different outlets. Um, it's about vaccines and treatments. Are we any closer to formulating vaccines or medical interventions to slow the spread of this coronavirus? I'm going to ask Dr. Tran to respond to that one, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, as you may know, <clears throat> development of vaccine and therapeutic um, for COVID-19 is one of the top priority of WHO. Researchers around the world now are working very hard to accelerate, to accelerate the development of vaccine and therapeutic for COVID-19. Currently, more than 70 vaccines are under development. And as of now, there are three candidate uh, vaccine in the phase one trial and one vaccine on phase two trial. Similarly, the several therapeutics are also in clinical trial globally. And WHO has developed the database for uh, clinical trials and conducted landscape analysis and which are now available on WHO website. And Solidarity Trial is the international clinical trial to have the effective treatment of COVID-19. Now, up to now, more than 100 uh, countries have uh, shown their interest or have joined in the solidarity trial uh, uh, the initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tran. The next question we have is from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. They ask, um, Based on WHO's observation of countries that have already lifted lockdowns, what are the essential services or industries that can be reopened and whose operations may not, um, may not lead to a second wave of infection? Dr. Kasai. Uh, I think it's a very important question. Um, some of the uh, European countries or the United States has a already start lifting or uh, announce the plan for lifting their measures. I think important things is that uh, there's no one size fits all and it's too early to evaluate uh, which approach uh, is a effective. But I think there are important key principles in, in addressing this uh, question. Number one, it should be based on the data and the public health principles. Number two, this lifting cannot go all at once, but should be a gradual and then the phase manner. Number three, 
we need to address this issue as a risk management. So individual interventions needs to be uh, assessed from the technical effective perspective, but it's also negative a uh, consequence of that. And then the perceptions of the people, public, political, and then also uh, in the market. And we have to uh, lift according to the result, depends on each cultural context. But we should, also, we should also remember why we're doing this. That is, we're doing this because we wanted to keep the number of cases below the healthcare capacity. And we're doing this because we wanted to protect the people. And maybe the business who has a low risk, such as a, a, a low uh, concentrations of the contact, or the business who can uh, adjust or modify the way they operate in minimizing the risk, may uh, start to risk uh, first. But this is a very important question, and there are many discussions, uh, I'm aware there are many discussions going around the countries. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. We have another question from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. In the Western Pacific region, what is the average percentage of health workers infected by COVID-19? Is the rate of infection among health workers similar to previous outbreaks? If not, why? Mm. And if yes, what are the factors contributing to a higher than usual infection rate? Dr. Mahmoud, could you respond to that question, please? Thanks, Alif. Infection among healthcare workers is very worrisome. We have seen initial phase of the outbreak when clinicians were not aware of outbreak happening in China and other countries. However, after the hundredth days, the worrisome trend now we are seeing in Philippines where the percentage is over 13 percent is, as I mentioned, is worrisome. In our region, overall is around two to three percent where countries South Korea, Australia, and Japan have low a percentage. However, other countries like Philippines are experiencing. We don't have exact data why the reason is that, but what we can see from the trend is that is the shortage of PPE, the training on how to use it, and then lastly, is it the overwhelm of the health system where more people are coming to that, uh, more infecting the healthcare workers. So it underscores the importance of personal protection, and WHO has been working very closely with member states in providing the necessary personal protective measures and also training them so that we protect this crucial, important workforce that are very important in running our healthcare workers. And we salute all those health workers who dedicated their life and some of them have lost. So Philippines is a bit of an outlier and we're working very closely with the Minister of Health to determine the reasons why Philippines has a high percentage of around 13% among infection among healthcare workers. Thanks, Dr. Mahmoud. The next question that we have is from CCTV. How does WHO evaluate the work of the Chinese anti-epidemic medical experts in the Philippines? Mm -hmm. Dr. Kasai, could you respond to that one? I noticed that the, not to talk to you on the screen, but I have to talk to the camera. Uh, I, I really noticed now. Um, yeah. I'm afraid uh, I don't have information about these uh, specific missions uh, here in the Philippines, but uh, I was told uh, there are many uh, similar missions uh, going in my regions. And I heard from the uh, Pacific Island countries that they really appreciate uh, the missions from Australia and New Zealand. I also heard from uh, Laos and Cambodia the Chinese uh, uh, missions supporting their response. And I think it's very important, the country who has experience, to share those experience to the countries who is really trying to ramp up their effective response. And I really wanted to continue to encourage and support that kind of things uh, occur in this region. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. The next question that we have, actually we've received from a couple of different outlets in Japan, from 
NHK and from Fuji TV, we have similar types of questions regarding the current situation in Japan. They ask, uh, the number of patients in Japan keeps increasing despite the Japanese government's declaration of a state of emergency. Um, what's WHO's response to how things are going in Japan at the moment? I'll ask Dr. Kasai to respond to that one as well. Thank you very much, Eve. Yes, we are aware that the number of cases confirmed in Japan is a increasing, which makes us concerned. We're concerned, one, because the increased number of cases might potentially stretch the uh, very important functions called uh, contact tracing and then quarantining people. So number one, stretch the public health uh, system. Number two, we're concerned because if the number of uh, cases increase, it would obviously start to stretch the healthcare facilities uh, functions. And so we're definitely a uh, concern, but we have to remember that the number we see today is a result of a few days ago. And what is important today is that every individual in Japan to try do their part in participating this a state of emergency, follow their advice and try to protect yourself, but also your family, friends and community and the country as a nation as a whole. So individual mindset to participate uh, in this uh, fight is the very important things to do at this point. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. We have another question also from NHK. Some in Europe and the US have criticized Japan regarding the limited number of PCR tests. Mm. What do you think about this? Uh, that's to me? Yes. Uh, okay. Testing is important to identify those who are infected uh, early, but should be a part of a uh, strategy. And uh, with a few exceptions, there's no such a countries who can offer enough testing. So what is important is that uh, there is a testing strategy to prioritize who to be tested. And more important things is that uh, the result of this test, it's not just a number, but should give information that uh, where the country is in terms of uh, stage of infection. So it's so important information for the countries to use to check where they are. And our evaluation is that uh, Japan is not yet in the stage of large-scale community outbreak. One more important thing of the testing is that uh, if there's a confirmed case, it should trigger the public health interventions, including a tracing and then the uh, quarantining those contacts so that we can minimize the spread in the community. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. We have another question for you. This one is from Marianne Benitez with The Standard in Hong Kong. She asks, how does the regional director respond to US criticisms about WHO's handling of the early stages of the epidemic in Wuhan and Hubei? And can you give a timeline as to when Wipro was informed by China and the actions taken during January? Over to you, Dr. Kasai. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's a very important question. And the uh, information is uh, already on the web page, and uh, we very much encourage uh, people to take a look. But let me go quickly the key points. So uh, the uh, 31st of December in 2019, our office in, in, in China, our country office in China, informed from multiple source that there are a cluster of uh, pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan. 
And in January the 1st, they informed me. And uh, we immediately uh, established the incident management team, not only at our level, but connecting uh, the other level. And we tried to verify the information to our counterpart in China. And since then, we are in the constant uh, discussions, exchange uh, with the, uh, China. And in the 4th of January, we have already shared uh, what we know. And on the 5th of January, we have a published a so-called the disease outbreak news to the world. And uh, on the 10th, uh, we have uh, issued a comprehensive package of the technical guidance online encouraging countries to set up the system to detect this case, similar if case, in case uh, if it's coming. And uh, we con constantly uh, have exchange. And uh, on the 20th and, and 21st, we put uh, our headquarter expert and our country office on the ground on Wuhan. And uh, uh, as on 22nd and 23rd and uh, 30th, the Director General called the Emergency Committee and uh, the International Health Regulations. And uh, the first emergency committee, the independent expert opinion was divided, but on the 30th, they come together and uh, recommended WHOs to declare the public health emergency of international concerns. We as organizations, we try our best to as quickly as possible and then as transparency as possible to respond to these diseases, but we have to review later and uh, we need to be evaluated uh, later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Pusai. Um, another question from The Standard. WHO headquarters seems to be more concerned about what's happening in Africa. Are all countries and areas within the Western Pacific region prepared for the long haul with their health systems and PPE stockpile? considering that treatment and vaccines are months or a year away. Mm. Sorry, that one, please. To whom? To me. Leave that, that, that to me. Okay. Um, please, or others can add as well. Sure. Um, I have a, a teleconference uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday connecting a regional director from all other uh, regions, together with the headquarters. And I noticed that uh, uh, some of the African countries are really facing a challenge. I have mentioned about the Pacific Island countries in my region, but they also have a very similar conditions. So it is very important that entire world would prioritize the country who has a limited capacity. So, um, I'm aware of the our discussions that we need to help uh, African countries. But in the same time, our regions also continue to, needs continue to uh, respond according to the situations and prepare for the large scale community outbreak. And so uh, we will coordinate together with the other regions and then we'll do our best to make sure that uh, all the countries who has a limited capacity to receive the support from WHO, but also to encourage not just the countries with a limited capacity, but the, every country around the world to be a, ready for the large scale community outbreak. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. The next question um, we have is from the Prangi Tonga. Uh, Tonga introduced an order to stop commercial flights and passenger vessels from entering the country on 23 March, and had, that's been extended until 12 June. There's no uh, national testing capacity uh, locally. So Percy Fonua asks, is it safe for Tongans to now go back to normal life with schools, churches, social clubs, and sports competitions beginning again? Dr. Kasai, could you respond to that one? Yes. Um, I'm in uh, regular contact of Tonga 
uh, including uh, the ministers. And uh, um, I'm aware that uh, uh, how difficult decisions uh, they made, the difficult decisions to uh, close the border. I'm also aware that uh, they, with the government leadership and then the ministers and leadership, they're really trying uh, in preparing for um, virus to come in and also to prepare for the large scale community outbreak. I noted that uh, uh, Tonga is really reach out to the community, uh, community leaders, religious leaders, women's class to be ready for this setting. I have already mentioned in the other questions that uh, those kind of uh, measures, when we consider lifting, we need a careful analysis of the situations. And we should not uh, lift uh, everything at, uh, uh, all at once. Besides, if the uh, outbreak uh, ongoing somewhere around the world, there's always the risk that the virus might uh, coming into their countries. And uh, I wanted to really urge, I know it's not, it's very difficult life under a uh, social distancing or the a uh, movement control, but very important that every individual to play their part. There are ways to protect yourself, ways to protect your family and community and vulnerable. And I wanted uh, all the Tongan to be a, a do that part to protect their countries. So the lifting, there should be a very careful considerations what to lift, but what not to lift. And as I mentioned uh, today in my introduction, it's really important for us, everybody to think the new way of uh, living. So that on one hand, we can suppress or we can control the virus but on the other hand, we can bring back our a, a, a life and economy. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Uh, we also have some questions from DevEx. Um, the first one is, the Western Pacific region continues to have the lowest growth rate in terms of COVID-19 cases. Does that accurately reflect the region's successes in combating COVID-19? or is it more a depiction of poor surveillance and weak testing capacity? Dr. Kasai. Thank you very much. Um, we assess the uh, situations uh, of the country where they are, whether they are in the stage, no virus transmission, but simply they're having uh, importations and some local transmission from those imported case, or there's already transmissions occurring as a cluster, but not a large scale uh, community outbreak occurring. We use the information to assess where they are. So it's not just a confirmed case, but we use a multiple information in assessing uh, the situations. Yes, we noted that uh, uh, our regions is uh, showing a very uh, slow uh, doubling time or suppressing the increase of the number of cases, or even some countries were able to bring the uh, virus uh, number down. But I think it's important that uh, we should not relax at this point. And then it's important for us to really think together, long-term strategy, new way of living, which is to balance, on one hand, how to continue to suppress the increase of the number of cases, but on one hand, to bring the economy and the social life uh, uh, back. Thanks very much, Dr. Kasai. Another question from DevEx. Um, can you uh, discuss which countries in the region have started on the solidarity trial. That's the large trial that WHO is helping to coordinate across many countries. And which countries have and the, which ones have not yet signed up and why? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Mahmoud to respond to that one, please. Thank you. So far, 100 countries over the world have joined the solidarity trials. 
in our region, as Ari, Dr. Kasai mentioned, most of them are in early phase or they were able to control it. So depending on the number of the sites that you have, you're able to join the trials. So in our region in the West Pacific, now Philippines and Malaysia have joined, and others are in the process preparing once they have a large community outbreak. We have been coordinating on a weekly basis with the member state, informing them about the solidarity trials and encouraging them to identify. So once they have enough cases, uh, hopefully we will not reach that stage, there will be more more countries in our region will join that. Thanks, Dr. Mahawood. Um, we have a question that's come in from um, a couple of different outlets relating to other areas of public health and how they've been impacted by the COVID-19 response. Mm -hmm. um, one of them specifically asks whether we have data on the impact on TB cases and treatment in the region of COVID-19. Dr. Tran, could you respond to that one? Thank you for the question. As uh, our regional director already mentioned in his um, remark, the, uh, the, it is very critical to ensure that uh, the regular health services should be provided to the population in the COVID-19 during COVID-19 response. For TB, it is also very critical to keep the case detection and treatment of TB patient. Uh, according to the, uh, uh, the online surveys of TB, uh, Stop TB Partnership recently, 80% uh, uh, of the uh, TB case detection has been decreased. And in many settings, like in Pacific Island countries, mass uh, uh, the screening uh, campaign has been suspended due to the uh, lockdown and social distancing uh, measures. Uh, however, the good news is that in some countries, the, uh, in several countries in the region, the uh, treatment of TB has been maintained uh, thanks to the uh, continued uh, providing of the uh, TB drugs uh, through the health care center and also through digi digi digital methods. So it's also very encouraging. Uh, currently, now WHO working very closely with uh, member states to ensure that uh, the TB treatment has been in place and to provide continued treatment for TB patients. And we are working closely to minimize the impact of uh, COVID-19 to TB program together with other public health programs in the region. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tran. Um, we have uh, more questions from some Japanese outlets. A couple of different ones have asked about this. Uh, NHK and Fuji TV. What is your view on media reports that the virus originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Dr. Kasai, could you speak to that one, please? I think uh, at this stage, um, it's not possible to determine uh, the precise source but available evidence suggests that uh, um, it has a, a origin from natural animal. Uh, again, uh, uh, there are many uh, researchers uh, studying uh, these issues, and uh, uh, we heard that uh, this might be originated from bat, but how it uh, reached uh, humans, we still don't know. There are many researchers around the world analyzing this genomics, and WHO wanted to really connect those researchers and then continue to identify a source of the origins. At this time, uh, we cannot conclude anything yet. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Uh, we have another question about um, data that was released by China last week. How do you see the latest revision of fatality data in China from Wuhan? And how does your organization see the credibility of the country's case counts. Dr. Mahamud. Thank you. It is very, very important that we have an accurate assessment of the case and deaths. We are in the midst of the largest pandemic in the world. And as we move, it's an evolving situation, we'll get the accurate number of the cases. So Wuhan has revised their numbers, increasing 50% of the deaths 
We have seen also other countries and other cities, including New York last week, adding 3,700 cases. So as we are in the midst of the outbreak, we will have more cases and more investigation be done. But what we are calling all countries to report it immediately as by the international health regulation to be timely. And eventually, once this outbreak is over or the pandemic is over, will be not the accurate number of deaths doing zero epidemiology studies, uh, surveys or that, and look in more detail. So we are calling all the country and member states to, th to report all the cases immediately, including the cases of death and the numbers as part of the International Health Regulations of 2005. Thanks, Dr. Mahmoud. Um, we have a question from Singapore, um, Straits Times, I think, on the COVID-19 situation there. Cases have increased significantly in recent weeks, and the majority are migrant workers, most of whom stay in dormitories with high density. Do other countries in the Western Pacific face similar issues? How do they prevent and deal with those issues? And are there any lessons that we can draw from this in controlling the disease outbreak? Dr. Kasai. Singapore is the country who really draw the lesson from the SARS and uh, develop a, a very strong plan and continuously uh, revising it. And uh, uh, even during this uh, response, I observe that uh, they adjusted according to the situations, very agile. And now I understand that they are in the uh, circuit breaker stage but even Singapore uh, now facing a very uh, uh, difficult uh, challenges. And what I found from uh, Singapore is that, uh, uh, what we can learn from Singapore is that uh, if there is a, a vulnerable uh, group, we need to really pay attention and then to protect uh, those virus to come into that uh, uh, vulnerable group. And then we have to make sure that uh, not just in the capital, but uh, uh, every corners of the, the countries. Singapore, they have a very strong system, so it's a very challenging situation. But I'm sure that uh, all their uh, uh, control measures would eventually uh, make also these difficult uh, situations uh, under control. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Uh, now we have a question from Bloomberg. Is WHO involved or advising China on its zero survey effort? Do you have any information on what antibody tests they're using? And what do we have to say about how reliable the antibody tests are? I'm gonna ask Dr. Huang to respond to that one, please. Thank you for the question. The serological test is used for disease surveillance and epidemiological research. These tests are extremely important to determine how many people has been infected in the population. And those data are very important for us to tell us where you are going in this uh, pandemic. And it is important uh, information to identify the true burden of the COVID-19 in the population. Currently, serological test has been developed and tested in a number of countries, including China, Korea, Singapore, and others. It is important to ensure that the valid validation of the test is conducted in the appropriate population and appropriate setting. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Tran. We have a question from ABS-CBN, uh, TV network in the Philippines. The community quarantine in the Philippine island of Luzon is set to end on the 30th of April. What does WHO advise policymakers here to do before they decide on whether to end or extend the quarantine? What should the authorities consider? And will a selective quarantine be more advisable? I'll ask Dr. Kasai to respond to that one. Thank you, Reeve. Um, again, um, there's no one size fits all approach and uh, uh, every country needs to uh, discuss within their own cultural context. 
but I can put the, a, a several a key principle again. Number one, uh, it should be a database and then a follow the public health principles. Uh, number two, there's no things that uh, you can lift uh, uh, all at once. We need to go uh, stage by stage, uh, phasing way. Number three, uh, those individual intervention should be uh, addressed in the risk-based uh, manner, i.e. to check its effectiveness in that uh, uh, cultural context, and then it's a negative consequence, and how that will be uh, acceptable. And we should always remember why we're doing this. We're doing this because we wanted to keep uh, the number lower than the uh, healthcare, healthcare facilities can manage. And we're doing this because we wanted to really make sure the vulnerable are protected. And of course, uh, business or some specific setting where they have a low risk or the business who can change the way do they do operations uh, in minimizing the risk may be considered the a first group to be lifted. But again, it's very important to have a system to monitor the epidemiological situations and other informations so that we can uh, continue to monitor whether we're doing this uh, lifting in the right way. And if not, we may have to also bring back certain intervention back. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Um, we have a question from RFI, Radio France Internationale, in Cambodia. Uh, in Cambodia, with COVID-19 cases stable at 122, um, normality is beginning to return, despite the warnings from health authorities. Are you concerned about this return of normality? And if yes, what message do you have for the people of Cambodia? Dr. Kasai? Um, I can you repeat the question? Sure. Yeah. Um, in Cambodia, with COVID-19 cases stable at 122, normality is beginning to return, despite the warnings from health authorities. Are you concerned about this return to normality? And if yes, what message do you have for the people of Cambodia? Um, we have an office also in Cambodia, and then they were working very closely with the uh, Cambodia government uh, and then the ministers. Uh, they have a very strong leadership and uh, they have a, a developed a plan. And then I'm observing that they're implementing those plans according to the situations. And then, the, yes, you're right. The number of cases looks like a stabilized, but I think it's not the time to relax. COVID-19 is infectious diseases. So even you are able to manage within your countries, if this virus is circulating somewhere around the world, there's always the risk that will come in and then overwhelm your healthcare services. So as I also answering to other questions of uh, lifting, we should be very cautious. We have to really assess the situations and we have to address this as a risk-based uh, uh, approach. But what I found is so important is that uh, whatever means we're going to lift, we should continue to keep uh, the basic element, which is the individual effort to protect yourself, protect your family, or protect your community, and protect uh, the vulnerable. And this is what uh, we're sending a message today. Uh, this battle, COVID-19 battle is going to be a long one. And it's really important time for us to think the new way of uh, living. For individual, as I mentioned, that they should be able to make this already as a part of uh, their life, routine practice. For the private sector, we want them to really think the way they can operate in the, uh, minimizing the risk. And for the government, we really wanted them to think how to bring back other important uh, regular services, such as immunizations or tuberculosis, but they should also use this time to prepare as much as possible for the, a large-scale uh, community outbreak. But the key is a individual really understanding of uh, 
what this COVID-19 means, and then do their part. So back to your questions, um, it's not uh, really a right time to relax. And really thank you very much for these questions. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Uh, we have a question from Sue Dunleavy with News Corp Australia. Australia's foreign minister has called for an inquiry into China's handling of the COVID-19 outbreak. Would you support this? And did China act too slowly or cover up the outbreak in the initial stage? Dr. Kasai. China has a responded to our inquiry about this uh, a cluster of uh, pneumonia of unknown cause. And then since then, we have a uh, daily exchange. And uh, what we have observed is that uh, China has been sharing the information under these uh, international health regulations to other uh, countries. What we have observed is that uh, once they have a, uh, gone through and become confident about this uh, virus, they announce that this is a new virus. And then they, uh, they also share the sequence of this virus. That allowed uh, other parts of the world ready to uh, set up the, the testing. I have checking like uh, uh, one country in the Mekong. Um, within five days, the country was able to already set up the system to diagnose uh, uh, this uh, virus within on their own countries. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Uh, we have a question from BBC World um, based in Tokyo. Uh, do you think, uh, what do you think plan B for Japan should be now that the policy of tracing and isolating cases has not been as effective uh, in Tokyo and Osaka is her question. I didn't get the question. Again, sorry, can you repeat the question? From uh, she, she has two, two questions I tried to summarize, but maybe it is uh, clearer if I uh, read the whole thing. Sure. From BBC World Service, mm -hmm. the test positive rate in the US versus Japan is striking, 20% in the US versus 9% in Japan as of today. Should we be optimistic about Japan now that the tests are given more extensively and there are lockdowns? And she also asks about what you think plan B for Japan should be um, in regard to tracing and isolating cases in Tokyo and Osaka. Um, so first part is about the, I think it's testing. Um, again, a test is important to identify those who are infected early, but it should be a part of a, a strategy. And uh, uh, what is uh, most important is that uh, uh, this test result be utilized as a tool to monitor the a, stage or the situations of the epidemic. And another thing is I've been a, reporting, experience from our region, using the test result for organizing the public health interventions, including a contact tracing and quarantining these people, which often include uh, a, a milder case or a symptomatic case, which doesn't go to the test is a, a working. And so now the next questions uh, related to that. Yes, we're concerned because the number of cases increase, that makes a really overstretch the facility or the mechanism to do that part. But we really wanted Japan to find out somehow to conduct this a, a contact tracing. There might be some innovative approach using like uh, uh, applications and to try their best to continue to do this. It is important that uh, uh, it's, it is really worthwhile for us to be overstretched so that uh, we can prevent that the stage will not go to large scale community outbreak where we are gonna really overstretch the a doctors, nurses, the healthcare worker. 
So um, I understand uh, where that question comes, but I wanted to really encourage people to continue to do those public health interventions. In the meantime, we have to also prepare uh, those large-scale community uh, outbreak. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Um, we only have time for a couple more questions because we've already gone over an hour. Um, I'm going to ask this one for Lena from Vietnam TV. Can you comment on the low number of cases in Vietnam? Any recommendation for the country in lifting its social distancing me measures in the coming days? Dr. Kasai? Yes, Liv, thank you very much. Um, Vietnam, um, they show a very strong leadership from a prime minister level, and then the deputy prime minister is really, uh, you know, they activating uh, their mechanism to respond to the COVID-19. They have a stage-wise a plan, and actually we observe that uh, uh, with the different stage, they're really implementing the plan according to what they have discussed. But not only that, they're always uh, learning from the uh, field and then adjusting uh, the plan. We observe that uh, uh, they have a testing, but also do the contact tracing. And I remember that uh, more than 80,000 people were at one point uh, quarantined. So they're really uh, conducting uh, a very strong uh, response to COVID-19. And I think that's the reason why they were able to continue to keep the number uh, small. But I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, behind that, I noted that the Vietnamese people are really contributing that. I know that uh, the life behind this movement, uh, the movement control or social distancing, is not that uh, easy. But yet, uh, the people in Vietnam, uh, I know that, that they're really doing their part. And I understand that the questions uh, is coming from those difficulties, that when we can lift those kind of uh, uh, measures. But I'm afraid, um, I wish I, we can finish this quickly, but it's going to be a long-term battle. And I think it's very important for all of us to think new way of uh, living. And uh, I wanted to also uh, encourage Vietnam to carefully consider what to start uh, lifting. So not all in once. And then uh, all those interventions are culturally sensitive. So we need to see uh, individual interventions, its impact in Vietnam, and also its negative uh, consequence in Vietnam, and how people can uh, uh, accept it. And again, why we're doing this is to keep the number below the capacity of healthcare and also to make sure the vulnerable are protected. So thank you very much. I understand these questions, but uh, let's prepare for the long-term uh, battle and then we continue to practice a new way of uh, uh, living so that we can on one hand, control the number, but on the other hand, we can bring as much as possible the economy and then the uh, social life. Thanks, Dr. Kasai. Um, I'm just gonna ask one final question that has come in from um, a few outlets, slightly different variations, uh, from Sky News amongst others. There's been a lot of talk about second waves of COVID-19 after countries seem to get the first level of infection under control. Are second waves inevitable? And is there a way to avoid this? Or should countries be planning for repeated cycles of surge and decline as they try to control the virus within their borders? Dr. Kasai. Um, thank you very much, Liv. Um, again, um, I, I think nobody can really answer uh, what will happen uh, in the future. Um, but if we see historically uh, the virus coming from animal, uh, eventually that then becomes a human uh, infectious diseases. It goes through a certain cycle, and then it takes a, a longer uh, time frame. 
So uh, to prepare for the second wave, particularly when the virus is circulating somewhere around the world, is a very important and, and uh, Im important things to do. And that's the reason why today we're really emphasizing that the COVID-19 battle will be a longer one. And it's important for us to prepare new way of living. And then I have also emphasized this a current a very strong measure would not be lifted everything at uh, all in, at once, but should be lifted gradually so that we can adjust those control measures. But if the individual tries to find a way, a uh, new way of living to minimize the infections, and if the private sector is also trying to find the way to operate in such a way, there might be a lot of uh, uh, avenue of innovations. And for the government to also think a similar way, I think we can uh, effectively prepare for the second wave. And then one important thing for the government is always try to prepare for the large-scale community outbreak. This, there should be no uh, regret. And WHO wanted to continue to work closely, particularly with the countries with the limited resources, to support them doing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasai, and thank you so much also to Dr. Tran and Dr. Mahamud and to all of the media that we've had connected today. Um, thanks for your patience in staying connected for um, an hour and 15 minutes. And we apologize if we didn't manage to get to your question. We tried to cover as many as we could. Uh, we look forward to doing this again soon. And if you have other urgent questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will endeavor to get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you very much and goodbye.